be an issue. I guess it would potentially work. Okay. Okay. Be an issue. Okay. How many people do you see online? Are they still coming in or Our, is it stabilized? There are 13, 15. It's increasing by the second if I look. Yeah, 17 Two people per now. second are joining. Okay. We've got like, now we've got 20. All right, great. We'll wait a couple more seconds then. Make sure that everyone has a chance to get in, get settled. Ooh, we're up to 30 now. We're up to and are they trickling in or is it? <laughs> it's a virtual talk today. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started now. Hi, here, there, here, better. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today whether you're here in person or with us remotely. Welcome to our PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture Series. Before I begin, I will remember this time to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Alaria Bertoletti. Um, for visual description, I am a white presenting female wearing a white top and black cardigan. This is our second lecture in the series this academic year. And to get us started, I'd like to talk about the logistics. If you are joining us remotely, you can communicate with us with the chat in Zoom. We'll be monitoring the chat. So if there's any technical glitches or errors, we do have someone standing by monitoring that. If you have a question, Please do hold those until after the talk. We'll be sure to answer everyone's question. If you are remote, please use the Q&A feature. We will also be monitoring that and we'll have the presenter respond to the questions after his talk. I think that should be it for the housekeeping. And I will now turn the floor over to one of our students to more formally introduce our guest today. Hi, I'm Rachel Sortino. Welcome to the PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture Series hosted by Gallaudet University. This lecture series aims to honor world-renowned scientists in the fields of psychology, education, cognitive sciences, and neuroscience. These different fields and all the interdisciplinary fields in between contribute to the new and growing field of educational neuroscience. They increase our understanding of the human mind and the neural mechanisms of learning. This year's distinguished lecture series theme is exploring the human mind from diverse perspectives. I am honored to introduce our distinguished lecturer today, Dr. Casey Lou Williams, who is a professor and director of graduate studies in the Department of Psychology at Princeton University. Dr. Lou Williams received his PhD from Stanford University in Psychology and went on to postdoctoral work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He currently directs the Princeton Baby Lab, which studies how babies and young children learn to talk, see, and understand the world. They use behavioral and neuroimaging techniques to understand how the developing mind works, how biology and experience shape our lives, and how caregivers can best support children's development. In addition to his work as the director of the Baby Lab, Dr. Williams is also the co-chief editor of Frontiers for Young Minds, one of my favorite journals. <laughs> it's a science journal geared for young children that is peer reviewed by students, not other scientists, but middle school and high school students. The goal of this journal is to ensure that STEM content is made accessible for young scientists. He's also a co-founder of Many Babies, which is a collaborative project that brings together researchers from more than 40 countries to address current theoretical and methodological questions about the nature of early development. 
please join me in welcoming Dr. Lou Williams. At this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you all. Hello to the nearly 40 participants on uh, Zoom. It's, it's so nice of you all to take the time today to be here. And there is no crowd I would rather speak to about my research today um, because a goal of the work in my lab recently is to understand communication broadly. And I think our field has been focused too much on verbal speech. And this is such an obvious idea to a lot of the attendees today. Um, but it, I think it's not a perspective that has taken root enough in the field more broadly. Um, and I would, I, I really can't wait to hear what you have to say about the studies I'm presenting. So my title is Dynamics of Communication in Infants' Lives. And one of my goals is to share with you why I think we need more descriptive work in our science. I do lots of experiments too. I'm not really talking about those today. I'm, I'm sort of intentionally <laughs> leaving experiments uh, out. And instead I'm focusing on our efforts to watch and understand real lived experience um, across kids and families and contexts. Um, and I'll sort of make a, a case for this now. I wanna start by thanking many people in um, my lab, the Princeton Baby Lab. I am nothing but the person communicating the work that they do. And um, they're fantastic. And I, I wanna thank a few funders, um, NIH, uh, Welcome Leap, the McDonald Foundation, and um, the founder of Google who helped me buy a thing once, which was great. Um, and also to various colleagues who have been uh, absolutely essential to, to this work. And I, what I love the most about my job is getting to collaborate with these people and former students. So I feel that, uh, and I'm going to just not pause on this slide because I'm going to read it word for word. We are off balance in uh, understanding development and learning. Development is a dynamic, noisy, continuous, gradual, interactive, embodied, physiological, highly variable process. And it's scaffolded by the social world. But we study development using sparse, segmented, short, distilled, unnatural, controlled setups, often separated from the social world. This to me is a problem. We have oversampled very short timescales and oversampled discontinuity in development, I mean, in part because science is hard and it's hard to do longer stints. And as a result of this, many theories are incomplete, unscalable, asocial, weakly computational, and lacking mechanistic power. They underemphasize learning and overemphasize innate knowledge. Um, I don't have direct evidence about what is learned and what is innate, right? But I do think that this approach where we study in experiments uh, the capacities of people um, leads us to perhaps not grapple with the complexity of real life. And so essentially every study I'm talking about today is trying to address that. Here's a world I want to live in, in uh, developmental research, in communication research, in psychological research. Okay, we can take natural interactions and we can do a few things. We can describe and quantify what we see. Um, we can use this to uh, validate experiments that have already been done and inspire new ones. And we can use this in combination to also model learning and change better than ever before, okay? And from the interactions between these, we'll have lots of new hypotheses. At the moment, I think we're sort of over obsessed with experiments, even though again, I love experiments and I do them all the time, um, but we are missing a lot, especially from the describe and quantify box. And I think the field has been led astray by not doing that enough. With this combination and these new hypotheses, we'll have better theories, we'll be able to build theories better, and we will better not just understand, but prioritize individual differences and contextual differences, okay? So not just variation across people, but across the context and routines of life and across communities and cultures. This is my lab. <laughs> That's it. There's some photos of our beautiful lab space where we're trying to do some of this work. 
and we do some in the lab, but um, more often these days, actually, we are studying natural interactions in, uh, in the home or out in the world. The basic premise of our work is this, that the dynamics of environmental experience and the basic mechanisms of human cognition combine to, shapes, uh, to shape infants' learning. Um, and you know, it's kind of obvious in some ways that there's an environment and then there's a kid and they have a brain, right? But it's the dynamics of environmental experience that have not been captured well enough. And then also we don't necessarily emphasize the basic mechanisms of human cognition enough. Um, we might kind of start with much higher order processes that, that may or may not even exist, right? Or at least are grounded in these basics. So I try to understand the interplay um, between the dynamics of environmental experience and the basic mechanisms of human cognition. This leads to uh, the main question I can articulate about all the work we do, which is to ask, how do infants learn from messy structure, but meaningful structure in their natural communicative environments? And this is, um, you know, this is basically what I find really interesting in life, uh, because you know these are foundational problems of what it means to learn, um, and we don't have a good enough window about the interplay between I think these two aspects um, of our experiences, which is we have an internal uh, set of capacities and our you know neur neural processes, but then we have to help them match the dynamics in the world across milliseconds, across minutes and hours, but also across years. And this creates an impossible puzzle, basically, but we can, we can try. I'm going to start by showing this video of a somewhat natural <laughs> interaction between parent and child uh, recorded via Zoom in their home. Okay. Turn this back down. I hope that sound came through clearly on Zoom to all of our all of our attendees. This is a beautiful natural interaction, and built into this is the very obvious point that. Um, well, first of all, not, is there, not only is there confusing reference, they're saying woof woof and holding a block, right? That already shows a confusing moment where how is the child you know, supposed to learn the word doggy or woof woof? But this uh, mother here is using social touch. She's using gesture. She's demonstrating actions, the block. She's using verbal speech. Um, she, is, uh, she is communicating with her body, okay? And yet, a lot of the field in studying communication is vastly hyper obsessed with studying speech only as if this is what you know captures what a communicative environment is all about and in fact um, a lot of mainstream research in this area you know uses lena recorders where you record a full waking day of the words um, and sounds in a child's environment and that's great and we've learned a lot but that's one dimension out of i think many that matter so in answering, in trying to address this multidimensionality of how early communication works, we can just picture another simple interaction between mother and child, right? Um, there is an exchange here of so many dimensions of information. There can be prosodic information exchange between them, um, exchanges of words, right? Whether verbal or nonverbal. Um, there are outward expressions of affect. In this case, positive affect. There is coordinated action. There using their spoons, right? Uh, there's social touch, right? This is an incredibly complex dance of behavior that occurs at every moment. Um, and then meanwhile, they have brains that need to synchronize with each other um, in complicated ways alongside their behavioral coordination. And that's just a dyad, right? This child is actually immersed in a context with many individuals, right? Represented by orange bubbles. Okay, there's important people like a parent or grandma, big sibling, nanny, neighbor, and then of course many others, and they have to disentangle this mess. I'm not talking today about our work on social networks and how they shape um, early communication, but, but I wish I had the time. So what are the attentional dynamics that allow uh, us to understand learning across very short timescales and across the longer timescales of early development? And a, an operating principle behind my work is, I'll say the opposite, 
of what Noam Chomsky thinks, frankly. Um, I feel that we are bombarded with an excess of information at every moment in time. Um, if you are a hearing individual, right, your eardrums are vibrating with fluctuations of air pressure, and then you end up knowing tens of thousands of words. That is, and it's millions of bits of data per moment just entering the auditory system, right? And if you are uh, a more visually based learner, right, there are endless complexities to your visual experience and dynamics across every unit of time that you can think of. So I do not see any kind of lack of data. Uh, rather, there is an overabundance of data that our brains can't possibly contend with. But there's, in a sense, too much learning data. I feel like that's the opposite approach to how the field of linguistics at least got started. So my talk is in four main parts today. And uh, if I feel a lack of time, I will skip a part of maybe the second section, but we'll see. I want to make sure I end with uh, this final section, the first 1,000 days project. So each of these is an independent chapter that builds toward um, a whole. Uh, each has its own methods, OK? And you can latch onto whatever is actually interesting to you. Um, and I'll go through this bit by bit. Uh, so each is a separate story, but converges in this goal of understanding the real dimensionality of children's early lives. Um, so starting at this beginning part here, we have studied infant-directed speech, which I've crossed out. Um, for, for decades, and I study it myself, but we're missing out here by using the word speech too much. IDS, infant directed speech. I, if I could go have power on the field, I would say, let's get rid of that term and instead think about infant directed communication and have IDC or something be a, a term that people focus on. And my postdoc, Jessica Kosi, who I'll show a picture of in a moment, has been pushing this work forward. Then I'll zoom in on uh, words and emotions. I'll then get to some uh, work on dual brain neuroscience that we've been up to. And then I'll end with a new project um, that we're in the middle of data collection for right now. So starting with uh, the idea of infant directed communication. Communication is so much more than speech. <laughs> this is the last crowd I need to say that to. But we don't yet understand the many overlapping dimensions of communication. Multimodality has been a focus for a long time. People focus on how we use gestures, right? But not necessarily how we use all of these dimensions of communication in parallel. Speech, action, gesture, emotion, and touch. These are five represented by little bubbles that do a disservice to the vast research that has gone into each of these individually. Uh, but we've taken these five as the dimensions we focus on to understand communication in a real lived sense. And Maybe speech is only 20% of the communication story. And in fact, equal weight is carried by each of these, especially from the child's perspective early in life. Perspective taking from what the child notices and learns from is important. So infant-directed communication, I hope you'll join me in kind of caring about this word more than infant-directed speech. In this simple pandemic uh, era study, we um, zoomed in to families' homes. There were 44 families that had children uh, who were 18 to 24 months, mostly high SES families, because that's who we could reach at this time. And they were uh, these were 10 minute free play sessions recorded on Zoom. And we used hand coding, which as you may know, takes a long time when you're trying to carefully code all these behaviors. And I'm jumping straight into this. So caregivers, this is the main point, vary greatly in their use of each of these dimensions. And again, this is a sample of hearing aids. So speech was the most commonly used in amount of time parents spent speaking during this 10 minute interaction, but with enormous variability. Some parents spoke for only 20% and some essentially 90% of this 10 minute period, okay? And you see the same variability across most of these. Action, was used a lot. And I can uh, I could carefully define each of these for you, but action might include demonstrating how to do something to a kid, right? Like um, if I was to demonstrate to you how to take the lid off of a jar, right? I might go, you know, like this. And we do this all the time with kids. We demonstrate actions. We use um, 
our bodies to communicate reactions in them. Gestures also varied a lot. Some parents used uh, zero gestures, and that includes referential gestures like pointing, um, all the way up to about 40% of the time. Emotion too. Um, emotion is a complicated literature, um, but we were especially talking about um, obvious expressions of emotion versus, say, a more neutral affect. That itself is emotion, <laughs> being neutral or flat, um, but we're talking about uh, kind of difference from baseline for that parent, and especially their use of certain facial expressions that we associate with um, communication with infants. For example, when we communicate with infants, we tend to do things like this, <gasps> right? We don't do that with adults, or we go, oh, right? And these are infant directed emotional expressions that we don't use with anybody. And then finally, social touch, it was the least represented, but still with pretty decent variability. Uh, and this excludes holding, by the way. So this is, doesn't count if you're holding the child, um, but it includes you know, tapping, you know, brushing, squeezing, you know, holding a, a brief hug-based holding. Each of these is probably carrying some weight in communicating important information to kids. Crucial to how we think about this is that non-speech communication occurs often. Um, and in this population, it occurs especially in the absence of speech. So if we look here, uh, when speech is occurring, uh, well, in silence, right, half the time, one of these other communicative modalities is being used. So by only studying communication as speech, which is the bias in the field, we're missing out on you know, this half of time when other dimensions of communication are coming in to support the child's learning in the moment. Um, and then when speech is being used, they're um, in fact even more likely. And what's actually interesting is many of these other dimensions of speech begin occurring right before the onset of speech. Okay, so they're previewing the onset of speech. Um, they are not a sideshow to verbal speech at all. They're in fact setting the stage perhaps for what is about to be said. So we're almost missing out on the trigger, on the, on the genesis of things that then this population goes on to, to say. Another important point here is that infants are not passive observers of their world at all. This is a trend, of course, in developmental science, as many of you know, to treat the child as an active agent in shaping their own learning curriculum. And there's lots of evidence now for the child actively shaping their own environment. Right, and they learn about the efficacy of their vocalizations, for example, because they learn that parents respond when they do certain things. And they're very elegant demonstrations of how this learning process unfolds. Here, what I think is great about embracing this multidimensionality uh, to speech is that the number of communicative dimensions from parents increases in response to infant gestures and vocalizations. So in this first plot, zero marks the time when the infant gestures. And right then you see this sudden, you know, I'll say not burst, but increase <laughs> in the parent's use of other dimensions of communication in the moments that follow, right? So they are using these, they are deploying these, especially when they detect active engagement from the child. And the same goes for a vocalization in the rightmost plot where following the child's vocalization, you see an increase. And I'll, I can explain that decrease, but don't worry about it. Um, anyway. And critically also, the use of infant-directed communication is linked to infant vocabulary size, both concurrently and one year later, okay? Not necessarily in the direction you expect, though. When parents are using more infant-directed communication, it actually means their child tends to have a lower vocabulary. So I'm not saying that the use of many dimensions of communication makes the kid whatever better and better, you know, at learning vocabulary. I mean, it may, but the main point here is that other dimensions of communication are used, especially when the child's vocabulary may not be um, as uh, quite as high yet. And then you might see a decrease in this population in the use of other dimensions of speech as the child's vocabulary grows. Meanwhile, there's a positive correlation between parents' use of infant-directed communication and the child's sustained attention 
on whatever they're doing. But I will say, uh, I'm not sure you should trust that finding because our reliability was pretty like low in coding. So we have a significant effect. I just don't necessarily trust it. I'd rather replicate it first. So <laughs> don't take that too seriously. But it shows that by using many dimensions of communication, it's helping the child be there, right? To sustain their focus. And we know from a lot of other research that sustained attention is something that really allows learning to come to life. So um, Dr. Jessica Kosi, my postdoc, who's starting as faculty at Arizona State in, in a month and a half, actually. Uh, she es essentially concludes from this early work, she's doing many other studies now, everyday caregiver infant communication is complex, okay? Far more complex than the field might have us think, and it involves the coordination of many modalities concurrently. And it's, it's obvious that there's research on multimodality, but I think there's not enough emphasis on the overlapping multidimensionality of communication exuding from us, including our bodies and arms and even affection toward one another, or lack thereof. So to follow up on this uh, work, um, Jessica is conducting um, similar studies in uh, an urban location, which is Nairobi, Kenya, doing the exact same work. And in uh, 40 villages in rural Malawi um, as part of an international uh, collaboration. And we've gotten some really interesting, mostly speech-based, uh, to be honest, uh, you know, data collection already complete. And now we go translate it, code it for a long time to come. <laughs> but this is helping us get beyond, of course, the convenient sample of North American and European university communities to let communities tell us for themselves what communication looks like via what they do naturally in playing with their children. And meanwhile, um, she's investigating how the use of different communicative um, dimensions varies across routines in the day. So uh, mealtime versus book sharing versus playing. So now I'm gonna zoom in, despite saying we're hyper obsessed with speech, I'm now gonna tell you about speech. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you now about one study on children's early words that they learn, okay? Again, trying to shed, uh, you know, break ourselves free from traditions in the field to think more deeply about how early word learning occurs. And then a study on early emotion dynamics. And this is collaborative work with um, three colleagues, a graduate student named Kennedy Casey, and my colleagues, Dr. Christine Potter and Dr. Erica Borges. So um, we tend to think of infants' first words as nouns. They refer to concrete objects. And this is the puzzle that has um, been you know, mystifying scientists for a long time. How do we learn these early nouns? But many of infants' very first words do not fit into established lexical categories and are grounded in routines. And I'll give you examples. Um, we are referring to this as everyday words. They do not fit into the categories of noun, verb, adjective, adverb. And yet they represent about 50% of first learned words across most languages in the world. Okay, And they've never been studied. <laughs> and uh, despite these words not fitting into um, lexical categories, most theories of word learning depend on stable visual reference. I won't go into detail here, but most theories at their core are about a child detecting what is said in front of what object over time. And it's this statistical learning process, perhaps, that helps you get to um, the appropriate word object things. So these words that I'm talking about here, everyday words, um, are again about half of what children are saying initially. They include words like, uh-oh, <laughs> and hi, yum, more, wow, shh, which, which counts as a word. All gone, no, thank you, right? These are routine-based words that don't fit into the categories of first words that everybody's been trying to study. Um, I'd love to hear about this more in the science community. So here's what's cool. We did an experiment and we totally blew it and we saw nothing, okay? We used visual depictions of each of these to the best of our knowledge 
as experimenters who have done eye tracking studies for a long time. Uh, we, you know, tried to find prototypical visual scenes that might be used when children hear these. And this was based on, you know, some, uh, we had families take photos of, you know, what their kid might have been seeing during natural productions of this. And we did our best. We followed all best practices. Um, with 15 month old English learning uh, hearing infants, we saw no evidence of successful comprehension. Despite at the same time, nouns, no problem. And then according to parental reports and even word productions, we know that these words are in their vocabulary. So by using you know, visual reference, right, or little depictions of scenes, we didn't get any evidence of their learning. So we backed up and we went, all right, let's describe. This is like an example of experiments failing us, right? We could have concluded, mm, no recognition of these, but no, we thought maybe the data that an infant cares about are different than what we might assume. So we backed up and just coded what we called the situations surrounding these, these words. Um, this was in video corpora uh, online. And uh, down below, you can see that we coded for visual uh, reference that were present in line with prior ways of thinking about um, you know, word learning. But second, the situation surrounding the utterance. And we had very careful ways of defining you know, situation. What was happening? Here are three examples of the uh, child, um, three different children, I believe, uh, hearing or producing the word uh oh. And you can see the actions that are occurring during this. Here's the first one. Oh. Right? They drop something. Here's the second. And then here's the third. Oh. Yeah. Um, that one, I'll explain, was the child, uh, the parent trying to zip up the child's sweater, and it was stuck. And they went, uh oh, right. So visually here, there's no easy way to define what the common uh oh <laughs> experience is, right? Um, but we coded the situation surrounding these. And first, I'm going to show you some data here, showing the distribution of the top visual reference for each of these words. Okay. And in blue, you're seeing at the bottom the most common reference, and then the second and third most common reference. And then in gray, you see all the other reference that the child might have been seeing when they heard, um, all gone, bye-bye, hi, etc. It's a tiny proportion, right? The, the objects present represent a, a, a tiny way of thinking about what they were experiencing in that moment. We got no explanatory power from looking at the visual reference to these early words. Showing, hmm, it, the story probably can't be about visual consistency. So then we coded these situations. And by coding the event occurring, the, the dynamic context of what was occurring when they saw these words, right? Uh, or when they heard these words. Uh, we got much more explanatory power. So the most common situation and the second and third most common situation accounted for actually a lot of this variability. And who are we to say that that is not what the infant is taking in, right? Our biases as experimenters led us to think about visual reference a little bit too much without giving enough attention to this broader idea. So examples of these for situations. Um, so for uh-oh, so an object falling was the most common one. A person falling was second. An object breaking was the third. Something being stuck, something being dirty, or an object being out of reach. A sudden noise, okay? These were the situations surrounding them. And then we see some explanation for why this might be learnable by young kids. And what excites me about this is that by going in, okay, I, I, I want to hear from y'all about the value of experiments, um, right? But by zooming in on the everyday context of these words, we learned much more than going in with experimental assumptions about what should be. Everyday words don't fit current theories, okay? 
yet they represent about half of our learning words. Oops, the field forgot about them for days. So what makes them so easily learnable in infancy? I don't have an answer, but frequency makes sense. These are more likely to occur in isolation, right? So they come prepackaged more than a noun or verb might. They tend to have consistent pitch contours. And I can use uh-oh as an example. Uh-oh, right? You almost always say it that way to a kid, uh-oh versus other words might not have that. And then we found that they have somewhat stable situational context. So this is a kind of a case I'm trying to make for description, right, to help inform a very important developmental phenomena of learning your first words. Right? And um, as a kind of check on this, you know, this is with a hearing population uh, and this is in the domain of speech, and I would love to hear about um, any thoughts about the learnability of diverse words um, in deaf and hard of hearing populations. So transitioning to a different dimension of communication, emotion, for a few minutes. I don't want to leave this off because, well, there's some emotion researchers here uh, and on Zoom, more Zoom participants now. Um, the moment-to-moment -moment emotion dynamics right, of everyday life shape toddlers' vocabulary growth. Okay, that's what I'm going to be talking about for, uh, for a few. And this is uh, graduate student Mira Nencheva, who is um, finishing up graduate school this year in my lab. And she has been kind of on this path for trying to link speech and emotion. And I could more broadly say language use and emotion which travel in parallel in very meaningful ways. And yet, we don't tend to unite these. These are separate fields, right? Those who study language and those who study emotion live in different corners of uh, psychology and, and adjacent fields. And so I really appreciate those who can <laughs> bridge them as a few folks in this room do. So we wanted to understand children's emotional experiences um, according to parental report in a lot of these uh, studies, which I realize is imperfect, but we can also justify why we did that. Um, but we wanted to measure the organization of children's early emotional experiences in their lives. And we did this in two ways. Um, first, in survey-based studies, um, we asked parents to rate how likely different transitions of emotion are in their child's lives. Uh, and then, and, you know, so they'd write, how, how likely is transitioning from happy to sad, okay? Um, adults don't tend to be very likely to go from happy to sad, because that's across the other end of valence. We tend to transition more within positivity or within negativity, such as from anger to sadness, okay? But children, as you'll see, are a little bit less um, organized than that. We also used ecological uh, momentary assessment, where we texted parents um, six times a day for 10 days to ask them what emotion their child was experiencing in that moment. And um, in every study we've done on this, it's many now, uh, we found that young children's valence organization increases with age. Okay. And the key finding I want to convey about this work, um, showcasing why we can't study language and speech um, separately from Emotion is that they are they are very linked. Experiments could help us understand causally why, right? But they are very linked. So here, um, we generally find that the more predictable children's emotion transitions are, the more words they know. Not causally, because it could be the other way around. So we measure something called a valence organization index. Um, this is the extent to which the child is more likely to transition um, to a more similar emotion, okay? So from happy to surprised, or from anger to sad, okay? So that means up on the y-axis means they are more likely to stay within valence. And uh, then their vocabulary size is shown um, on the x-axis in these two plots. So in having parents rate, right, just via report how common these transitions are in their child's lives, we found that children's vocabularies were higher if their children 
uh, tended to, like adults, transition between similarly valent states. Okay? And vocabularies were lower when they were less organized in that way. And then same for the texting-based uh, EMA study. Okay? If, in, according to these texts, they would, you know, they would write, my kid's feeling like this, and they'd use a slider right, on, along all these dimensions six times a day for 10 days. And the more organized their transitions were in valence, the higher the child's vocabulary was. And in related work, we wanted to know how parents package words in the domain of emotion. And the finding shown in green here is that emotion words are surrounded by utterances that increasingly match in valence. These orange bars, okay, they show you four example sentences of what a parent might say. This parent said, wind, I don't know why they said this, wind coming over, water is damp and cold. What's he doing? Is he sad? So prior to the appearance of that word sad, you saw all these semantically re related words that we might think of as negative, okay? Um, damp and cold, for example, appeared two utterances earlier, and these would be classified as negative valence words, right? In the plots on the right, you can see um, that for both, both eight basic emotions, happy, sad, etc., as well as uh, 94 um, mental states that we can be in, okay, we saw the same pattern, that with zero marking the use of a particular word like sad, okay, and then in the often three or four preceding or three or four following sentences, you saw the parent scaffolding the child's learning of that word, okay, they were using other sad related words in the utterances that appeared nearby, or other happiness related words in the utterances that appeared nearby. So implicitly, of course, we don't know we're doing this, but parents are very skillfully packaging together words that support the child's learning of, of these emotion-related uh, vocabulary uh, items in this rather elegant way where um, you know, they're, they're helping them link happy with maybe sunshine or happy with smile, right? By packaging this together in very careful ways. The more they did this, right, the better kids learned words over time. So valence context across months helps toddlers learn emotion labels. Um, and this age of acquisition plot, right, shows that, yes, the more parents did this, this packaging and nearby utterances to support learning of an of a, uh, emotion word or mental state word, the earlier children learned those words. And then here, in these plots, uh, we, we looked at um, the parents' use of this kind of contextual support in over the course of months to then predict if the child did or did not learn that word in the many months that followed. We essentially divided corpora in half. These were longitudinal corpora. And the more parents did this packaging in the first half, the more likely their child was to produce that word um, in the second half. So, showing that valence context, right, the, uh, the use of emotion-related words over time seems to support the learning of this complicated type of vocabulary. So that was another way of like trying to capture right, the everyday dynamics of emotion and trying to understand how it might inform our understanding of language learning and vice versa. And Mira is very interested actually in linking this to um, these dynamics to later mental health uh, in childhood and beyond to try to see how the ways that we use uh, language, right? And emotion in the household might be actually a, a really powerful window into understanding variance in mental health outcomes later. So that's a goal of hers uh, long-term. After she leaves graduate school this year, she'll be very sad. She's such a, she's losing a close coworker. It's always sad as a, as a professor. So you can see this coordination, right? Where the parent is using communicative dimensions in certain ways. The child is learning in certain ways based on that input. And in the work I've been talking about here, I've been focused on uh, behavioral coordination, but, uh, and I, I hope, this is an educational neuroscience you know, lecture here um, or, or center, 
So I am now excited to tell you about um, our recent work on neural synchrony between uh, in dyadic interactions, at least at the moment. So two-way interactions, right, we've known for a long time, provide continuous information about communicative conventions via feedback to and from caregivers. And um, I'll skip over that second bullet point. This is a former student, um, Elise Piazza, who's now a professor at um, the University of Rochester. And this is her in her natural habitat. She loves playing the piano in fMRIs. She just does that like all the time in her research. <laughs> um, and she's wonderful. And she really spearheaded this, uh, this work to examine um, what the infant brain and the adult brain are doing during natural embodied communication. And this was the first study of what the developing brain and adult brain do during natural play. And we used FNIRS, uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy. This is used in uh, some labs um, here at Gallaudet. But I'll briefly say um, this works by, well, we're, we're trying to show the extent of neural synchrony or coupling um, between brains. And um, you do this by shining near infrared light at the head. <laughs> it goes, some of the light goes uh, through the scalp and the skull into the outer surface cortex, right? And gets absorbed, some goes back out. And you can capture basically how much of that light comes back out in this uh, elliptically shaped path here. And um, this varies depending on the presence of oxygenated or deoxygenated um, hemoglobin. And this is a great method for, standing, for, for developmental neuroscience for a range of reasons, because they can move. That's the big one. But it's also very limited because its spatial resolution is not, uh, of course, nearly as good as fMRI. But its temporal resolution is quite decent. And this is a big risk doing this project. We um, were basing it off of prior work, showing that when adults you know, listen to a story told by somebody else, right, the neural activity of the storyteller and the listener tend to share a lot of features. But we went a little crazy and said, oh, let's try this with infants. Let's do it with FNIRs instead of fMRI. Um, let's do real-time interaction as opposed to pre-recorded stories. We, we took too many risks, and you shouldn't do that as an assistant professor. But um, that's what we did about uh, starting about eight years ago. Here are a few examples of what this study looked like. We had the um, parent, uh, well, in this case, experimenter. Okay, but we've later done studies with, um, with parents. And uh, infants who are 12 months old on average doing a variety of activities, including playing right here. He also sang. I love watching that kid smile and kick. The, the singing condition was very powerful. In this case. Reading. And lastly, here's a control condition. We called it the apart condition, where the adult and the infant were still in the same spots, oriented a little bit further from each other, um, each doing their own thing. And we use this to examine spontaneous neural coupling when you just share a space and share uh, acoustic input in this case. The adult there was talking about her anniversary or something very boring to them. And this was to make sure that the two weren't just furiously coupled for reasons that we don't necessarily care about, to, but to control for baseline um, coupling. And we, um, we pre-processed the data um, by doing some basic motion correction um, and band pass filtering, and then computed uh, intersubject temporal correlations, or ISCs. These are essentially simple Pearson correlations between the same channel in the infant as in the adult, right? 
but also compared to every other channel on each other's brains. And you can use this to generate a giant matrix like this. So here, I'm showing you group average ISC matrices. And you are seeing these for all uh, uh, channels, 57 channels on each brain um, for each condition. So and each cell represents a heavily corrected uh, R value. And um, so in the upper left corner, in yellow, that's indicating greater relationships between the infant and uh, adult brain. Um, and you're seeing that these are clustered in prefrontal cortex in particular, okay? We also had, uh, and this is kind of a cartoon illustration below of the brains where we saw uh, the most significant relationships between um, the brains. You can see mostly in frontal areas, but with some parietal as well. And, um, and there were critically no relationships in the apart condition after this you know, heavy, uh, heavy correction of multiple uh, comparisons. So this was kind of the first uh, sanity check demonstration that the infant and adult brain show similar firing in similar places at about the same time across brains. And that gave you a sense of the overall uh, spatial relationship in PFC and parietal areas, okay? But next I'm turning to the temporal dynamics of coupling. So what we did was to see if the brains are actually aligned in time, not just summarized across the entire interaction. And we wanted to know essentially whose brain is leading the interaction. Um, and I think I'm spoiling my finding by saying we expected uh, the adult, we might stereotype in fact, an adult as being in charge when they're interacting with a nine to 15 month old. Um, but there's also a possibility of the infant being the one whose brain is in control. So what you do um, is you take the uh, signals from each brain and you shift them apart in time. And then you recompute ISC. And a peak at zero would mean the two signals are synchronized perfectly in time. Um, and a flat line uh, would mean they're not synchronized at all, as in the apart condition shown in blue. And this to me is the most uh, kind of interesting finding of the whole thing, which is that the infant's signal preceded the adult's signal in prefrontal cortex. And that's evidenced um, in this plot here. There was a slight negative, a, a bias toward negative lags. So the infant's brain was slightly leading the adult's brain. Activity in the infant's brain was reflected seconds later in the adults, okay? That could lead one to conclude, oh, you know, that means the infant is really in charge. And that is true when it comes to neural activity. But in reality, it probably reflects that the adult was accommodating the attentional dynamics of the infant in real time. They were, the, the adult was sensitive to what the baby was about to do, right? And then they, they kind of followed suit. So it's still kind of showing the baby's in control, but again, that's because of maybe skilled uh, adulting. <laughs> and I would like to show you so many more uh, aspects of this, but here's one that I'm finding really interesting that's emerged from a more recent study. We found that infants with more stable conversational turns from one to two years of age, 12 to 24 months, have stronger neural synchrony with caregivers. This is from a longitudinal study where we um, measured household interactions um, using the Lena-based technology um, from uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, sorry, 12, 18, and 24 months, I should say. And we found that infants who have more variable amounts of conversational turns over time with their caregivers have less synchrony with their caregivers. Okay, let me, I'll put this another way. Infants with more stable or predictable turns in their environment over the course of that year, right, have stronger neural synchrony with their caregivers. And this is not saying that infants who, who get more conversational turns with their parents are showing more coupling. That's not it at all. It's actually the predictability in getting a response from their parent when 
they try to get one, right? That is what predicts neural synchrony. And I think that's really, that's really important, right? Because we tend to just quantify amount of something that a child gets and view that as the important signal for understanding their learning. But here, it's a more qualitative aspect, of it, right? Which is, is what does their parent respond reliably over time, right? Stable, stability leads to greater synchrony with your caregiver, neurally. And this framework uh, of dual brain, uh, uh, infant adult dual brain research has um, kind of spread in various ways in the last couple of years. It excites me greatly. I think this, uh, the developmental multi-brain framework provides a promising approach for understanding many things. The transition from home to school, okay, where you go from interacting with a very important person or two at home to then suddenly having a very important person, uh, you know, your teacher. And to what extent does shared neural activity with the important people in your life at home predict later success in school entry? Um, it may have promise for understanding developmental delays and disorders. And then getting into a bit more basic science, uh, it'll help us understand playful learning better, whether it's leader follower dynamics or the dimensions of communication that we um, use when talking, to, uh, when communicating. And then also it can help us better understand attention in a real social context and memory in a real social context and communication embedded in real life. So pulling this all together, I want to tell you about a currently in, proge uh, in progress study we're doing, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> this project is more than um, we thought we were getting ourselves into. <laughs> and it's called the first 1000 days data set. And the goal of this, it is not necessarily going to be what happens, but I hope the goal for this is that any lab will be able to deploy their models and their ideas on this data set. That's what we're trying to do. I'll actually skip this in the spirit of getting straight to it. So we're asking in this work, how do the fully natural statistics in infant environments give rise to learning? This was um, work inspired very much by Deb Roy's uh, speech own project at MIT, where he recorded his own family um, for multiple years from fisheye cameras in their home. And one or two papers came from that, and then it was closed off to any other researchers. So it didn't help us understand that much except for his own family's stuff. But what we're doing now is kind of exploding this concept into um, 16 uh, babies and households. Um, and critically, my colleague Uri Hassan, um, whose name I put on a Hollywood square because he is so wonderful, uh, at least in this silly infographic. Um, he is just this, he is this big dreamer who is never intimidated by any project. Um, and it's something very much co-developed with him. Without him, we wouldn't be doing something quite as crazy. So maybe I should be mad at him actually. Uh, and then Dr. Liat uh, Hassenfratz, who is, um, who is coordinating this project in just invaluable ways. With this project, we want to see what development really looks like. It is a process of increasing complexity and accumulated change over time, okay? And again, that is a very different way to think about, you know, maturational development uh, or kind of the idea that we're born with certain capacities. This allows us to see the complexities of learning over time. Um, oh, you, it was 18, Never mind. Pretend the word 16. We are gathering 16 independently interesting video corpora from families in New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania, okay? And they're in uh, 16 different homes and we are recording them in their homes from eight cameras and four microphones for 12 hours per day for 1,000 days continuously from the moment they get home from the hospital with their newborn. And um, this is far too much 
to be able to manually code and annotate. A lot has changed in the artificial intelligence world in the last month, even, let alone six months, let alone 12 and 18. Every six months, it's a new era now for this field. And we are trying to stay right there with it and use new tools to automate um, a lot of uh, coding of natural behaviors and develop tools ourselves as well. We have um, eight uh, white families, four black families, two Asian American families, and one Native American family in this. And here's a, a mock toy setup of what they um, might be doing, right? Here's a fake layout of a fake home. Um, and we position two cameras per room in four key rooms, as well as uh, microphones. All of these data are automatically uploaded to eventually Amazon Word Cloud. And then there it is, ready for us to do science. <laughs> but it's so much data. And uh, this is something that we're grappling with right now. Um, so we are getting 2,000 hours of audiovisual data per day. Um, 100,000 one minute clips stored per day onto our server. And this is leading to 2 million hours of audiovisual information, which is totaling 250 years. Okay. So <laughs> that would take me, you know, a few lifetimes to watch direct continuously with uh, Dr. Serena Young in biomedical data science at Stanford University, we have developed a baby detector um, that helps detect where the baby actually is using video and audio uh, information. And this allows us to not look at most of the video that we need to. In the end, this will mean we'll have a corpus of about 20 years of active child interaction. Uh, I could go into those details, but I'll skip it. So um, here is a demo family. It's my family, actually, when we were testing out some of the equipment. Um, and here are the kinds of automated information we can get from, uh, from Video Corpora now, okay? At the scale of this project, that's a different story, but at least in short clips. So you can get automated, moment to moment, uh, artificial intelligence detection of objects in the room. Um, whoops, so yes, so here, uh, I'm sitting on the floor. It says I'm 100% person. It says my wife is 98% person, so I don't know what that means. I told her she's 2% superhero, so she, you know, so it's actually really it's actually correct. Um, and then one of our kids and books and window. So it's able to detect some object at least automatically, which might help us give it, get an automated uh, view of what rooms look like. Here's a demo family, also not one of the participant families. There are ethical considerations about that that I'll share. Um, but these object um, programs look something like this. At every moment in time, you're getting a confidence estimate of what objects are present. And we do this times the entire 20 year <laughs> corpus in the end. That's object estimates. There are great tools now for getting body pose estimates. Um, I don't want to, you know, over promise here, but these might, uh, well, they might be meaningful and work in the end for certain kinds of movements. And these programs can essentially add neon bones to you know, the bodies of people as they engage naturally and allow us to see who is near who, what their body orientation is, what their proximity is, even maybe down to the point of their use of, of you know, limbs to demonstrate actions or gestures. We can get language estimates quite well now using various tools. Skip that one. And um, I will note that it took a lot of planning to make this happen uh, and a lot of caution and a lot of communication with various offices at, on Princeton's campus. Um, but one uh, rather important thing I wanna share is that each family is getting $90,000 for participating in this project. That's minimum wage, times 12 hours a day times a thousand days, basically. And um, this allows the parent to not have to make the choice of working outside the home to support the family 
versus being in the home to support the family. They can get compensation for staying home playing with their kids. Um, there are many ethical and legal considerations with this project. So privacy information about families, right? That's something we thought about seriously. Um, something else complicated is what about mandatory reporting um, if we witness or see behaviors that are not acceptable? So we had to work through those problems. Um, also, when the baby turns 18, they have the right to delete the entire corpus off of planet Earth. So once they turn 18, they'll have the uh, right to, to do that as adults. And um, we also have required meetings periodically with uh, a psychologist um, just to make sure that families aren't feeling weird about being recorded. Um, what's really interesting is these families um, report absolutely no problems with this whatsoever. They said within about two days, they just got used to it and they don't care. Um, and they, they think of it as sort of a video version of Alexa. Um, and they, they don't seem to, to be concerned. We've gotten zero, zero complaints so far. It's been about a um, year and a half or two years. And we have a data safety monitoring board, a DSMB. Um, and this is a um, independent group of people who oversee the project and can shut it down at any time if they want to. And we have uh, meetings every um, six months with them and they have various types of expertise. And there are key limitations to this work. Uh, so, I mean, will the automated, will the pipeline work? Will the diverse analyses we want to use actually work? Families are really into it, but will that be true over time? Uh, the project is based in North America. Uh, so we can't generalize to the rest of <laughs> humanity, of course. And the needed technology barely exists. And so we're, we're doing our best here. But we hope in the end, you'll be able to find this data set useful for your questions. And I want to, for this project alone, thank, this is just a, and this isn't even all the people who have touched this project so far um, in various ways, but various tech groups, our mental health team, human subjects and protections um, folks, um, people who just helped us set up the cameras and the microphones, that was a nightmare, and our funders. Um, but especially Uri Hassan is, a, is a, the force behind this. So with, this kind of large scale window into actual natural life. This is as much as I think we'll, as natural as we could ever do as scientists to, under, to look at development. Um, again, limited to just the 16 babies. I think we'll get closer to this goal I talked about at the beginning of um, being able to describe and quantify better, use that to validate experiments and develop new experimental ideas and then engage in better than ever, ever modeling of development and communication, helping us build better theories and understand variation in a meaningful way. So I hope uh, through the course of this presentation, I've helped you see how taking time to describe real life can support our understanding of children's development in important ways that we can't do with experiments. And then we can turn to experiments and help us, you know, to help us learn what we can't learn by just watching, which is to get at mechanisms that explain where that variation really uh, you know, comes from based on the child's capacity or the parent's uh, interaction. And with that, I have to thank my lab and I'm excited to take questions for the next 20 or 25 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a beautiful presentation. Um, so if anyone knows me, they know that I always have tons of questions, but I'm going to hold off on my questions and first see if anyone here in the room has any questions and see if anyone from the Zoom audience has questions. So starting with the in the room attendees. Okay. And now turning to the Zoom folks. All right. Well, then I guess I'll open up the floor. Oh, wait, no, we do have someone from the room. Hi, thank you so much for such a stellar presentation. I've got a million questions and I'll have to figure out which one to prioritize. So 
first is just a basic question about the last study that you talked about. Will those videos have enough information about the gestural movement? Like do hands get captured and would it be enough to inform what we know or looking at gestures this is a personal question for some of my future research. So this is what I'm asking for. I love it. I'll say this right now, right now, no, but we're working with this, uh, this data scientist, uh, and computer scientist at Stanford to make these uh, programs better and better. So there are amazing programs for studying animal behavior, um, even of fruit flies and capturing tiny dynamics. So this is a solvable problem. Um, it's going to take some time, but the goal is to get it to a point where we can see gestures, categorize them at the same, with the same accuracy as human coders. Um, and we are getting really close. We have great accuracy for proximity, for speech, um, some object-based uh, things, and, and not quite gesture because it's, it's a little bit, it's a bit, it's just smaller. And it depends on the position of the cameras, for example. Um, but I do think we're going to get there. And, you know, it'll take a little bit longer than the other tools. Is it, oh, I want to say five years, <laughs> something frustratingly long. Um, but in the end, I think the technology, especially being developed by Serena Young at Stanford, is going to really change developmental science and the communication sciences. Um, because people in this field are not yet aware of, I think, what's happening. And deploying these tools is hard. And it might take our field a while to catch up. But in the end, I do think we're going to have the fine grained detail to be able to say something about at least basic gestures such as, you know, restaurant tips. Thank you. That's very exciting news for me. So that means, oh, over here, that means that the video quality is pretty high. And then, so like later, let's say that a model is developed to analyze the video data that you would at least be able to see enough of the information that's there in the video. Is that right? We, we hope it isn't good enough. We're finding it's good enough quality for certain analyses. Um, we've mostly been focusing on speech because it's the lowest hanging fruit technologically because people have been working on uh, speech to text recognition for quite a while and this brand new program whisper is amazing um but time will tell if the videos are good enough for capturing that you know detail um but i i do have hope um it's just gonna take time and money <laughs> great thank you Um, so I don't make errors in uh, translating. I'm really still not, I'm still working, still working on that. So this is a question from Dr. White, uh, who could not be here, but you've met earlier in BL2. So he's saying, thank you for your wonderful talk. And the question is, the dynamics you discuss seem to depend on some level of shared social contingency. How do you think these dynamics might change in the presence of communication barriers? For example, most deaf children are born to hearing parents who do not know sign language. How could these parents leverage some dynamics to communicate with their children in the absence of, ac absence of accessible language? So I'll put it this way. Turn-taking is itself a multimodal experience. And we're doing a project on that. Now, we think of turn-taking as something that occurs within a modality, right? A speech behavior from a child leads to a speech response from a parent, right? Or maybe me pointing over there might cause somebody else to look over there, point, right? But we're trying to broaden our definition of turn-taking to look at sort of a ping pong, ping pong game, essentially, between different aspects of communication, right? I can, I can point and you could go, Whoa, right? You could use an expression of emotion to take a turn in response. I could say, um, I could produce some word, and you can respond by uh, demonstrating something to me. Okay, so we're trying to look at turn taking and social contingency in as broad a way as we possibly can. And I think, you know, by defining it that way, 
you actually will see a lot of turns being taken um, between, you know, uh, children who are born deaf to hearing parents. Um, just maybe not in the domain of language for a while until that child is able to perhaps, you know, produce and communicate um, in ways that are understandable and vice versa for their caregivers. But I would think that emotion turn taking, right, or emotion to gesture turn taking, or action to touch turn taking is still occurring a lot. And we don't know much, to my knowledge, about social contingency defined very broadly in that way. And so you still can get this stage setting for having a responsive caregiver just in ways that the field might not have, uh, have had the capacity to grasp yet. Um, or if there's research in uh, the study of deafness um, that I don't know about, I would love to, I would love to hear more. Um, I'll go with another question that is really quick from um, online. So do any of the babies in the thousand day study have any kind of disabilities or have different hearing levels? No. And what I'm proud of in this project is we initially said we are going to recruit the first families that come our way. We are not going to discriminate in any way. They could be anybody. And we um, advertise the project in very diverse ways. Um, you, you name it, right? We, we, we use it to try to find families who are, who are interested. Um, we had no idea if nobody would want to do the study or if everybody would want to do the study or something in between. Um, so we welcomed variation in every dimension. Um, hearing or vision impairment would have been very welcome. Um, variation in socioeconomic status has been very welcome. Racial diversity was a priority. Um, and uh, family structure was another one that we really wanted to have more variation in. Everything from you know a single parent to extended kin living in the household. In the end, we actually didn't get that much variation. But what I at least, you know, the mindset starting out was we'll take anybody with any family structure, with any dimensionality to their demographics, even if they're sending their kid to childcare for eight hours a day, great, because that's natural life too. It just means we get less data from that family. But unfortunately, uh, we do not have any um, anybody who is um, deaf or hard of hearing or visually impaired. To our knowledge, to date, I should say. Hi. My question is about your first study um, with the interactions between children and caregivers. First, I have a comment. Um, I thought about a study that was done by the interpreter is not sure if she got it right. Pizer, P-I-Z-E-R. I'm forgetting the exact year that the publication came out, but they were looking at deaf moms and their deaf infants. And your findings that the children really are leading the way and that there's interaction with touch and those different dimensions really tie in very nicely with that study. I'd say that it was very, very similar. And it's interesting that within one language system, oh, regardless of the language system, I think that that shows some nice evidence that turn-taking is really important. Visual attention, joint attention, eye gaze. So that was my comment. Second, my question is that I'm a CODA, that means I'm hearing and my parents are deaf. And I remember growing up watching my parents interact using sign language. And I remember times where like, for example, you know, I'm coming into a room and I'm behind my mom. And instead of me walking all the way over to her, I would tap the floor because I know that she would feel the vibration and where the vibration was coming from. So then she'd turn around. So I'm just thinking about how would you code for things like that? You know, was that under an action? Is it child initiated? Oh, that's a beautiful question. I, I, I learn from questions and that's one I'm learning from. Um, we are not capturing that type of communication um, unless, some of our action coding might. It would have to be pretty overt, though. It would have to be very observable. <laughs> um, and it sounds like some instances of this behavior were perhaps subtle. It would, it would perhaps look like walking toward uh, your mother, you know, from behind. So, you know, if we set out to code 
that I think we could probably capture instances of it. But at least in our current coding scheme, we would not capture it. And this is such a beautiful question because you're showing that the dimensions of communication we latched onto and made decisions to include are definitely not the whole story, okay? So um, in fact, communication via foot stomping and vibration is something shared across species. Um, and there's really interesting research happening right now, um, actually in Kenya at a research center where they're studying elephant communication. And it's um, for miles away, there is stomping to communicate different messages to other elephants that might be within, nearby. And like that's this gorgeous comparative work showing that there's something about the kind of interaction of our bodies with not just the ground, but with the objects around us that is meaning a lot to somebody. And that's not the same thing I think as action, right? It's, it's an attention getting uh, that is using a different modality. And so that's um, something I appreciate because it's broadening my thinking about um, you know, how a bid for a socially contingent response might be different across individuals in different circumstances. Hi. Fantastic presentation. Really just so captivating. Um, my question is really about the emotional regulation strategies. So thinking about your the second part of your talk, the idea of stable emotional valence, where like, you know, transitioning from sad to angry that you're basically staying within one end of the valence. One thing I was thinking about is the development of emotional regulation strategies and how to stay in that one valence. One of the things that I think about a lot is that often our emotional regulation strategies really fluctuate in a sort of binary way. We use also other people to regulate our emotional experiences by talking about emotional experiences, getting someone else's point of view for new insight. So I'm wondering what your perspective, well, I'd like to know, I guess more so what your intuition is about how parents use some of that contextual development for emotional for emotions to create an idea of an emotional experience and that maybe that is the beginning of the process for a child to develop the understanding that each person has their own emotional regulation so there's interpersonal emotional experiences hopefully that's clear yeah great so um something i think you'll uh, you know, you'll appreciate, Rachel, is that um, <sighs> emotion regulation is probably the slowest thing to develop in all of childhood. Um, Self-regulation, especially, is the slowest thing to develop in essentially any child. And that's something I find really interesting about, about emotion compared to other aspects of development, of which there are many. And the system is set up as, uh, as fully contingent on those around you to regulate. Parents help their kids stay in line, right? Or behave in certain ways. And the child just can't do it themselves until they're 20? I don't know. Um, <laughs> 40? Um, so, you know, the question is, what are those, you know, what, what is that organization that the parent's doing? And how, how does it vary? And this is why I think Mira Nenchefa's approach um, to capture early development as this period that's you know, stage setting for, for mental health and well-being later is really powerful. Um, if you have a parent who tries to get you from, you know, uh, within valence, happy to surprise, surprise to joyful, whatever, um, it seems unlikely they try to keep you within negative necessarily, right? So that's kind of funny. There's like a different motivation. You actually might expect good organization to be moving from feeling angry to feeling fine again, feeling good, right? So I doubt there's overt effort to kind of organize within 
the kind of negative end of emotions, but there I think certainly will be efforts to de-escalate, right? Um, but then by default, the child is may maybe not as likely to be able to get back to positive themselves. They would they rely on you know the the parent to do that at the time. So um, by you know looking at even this data set that we're capturing right now, um, maybe we can get reads of emotion via vocal affect, maybe via facial expressions, if technology can get there for natural video. Um, not there yet. Uh, and we'll be able to see thousands and thousands and thousands of examples per family of what they're doing in different moments to organize their child's emotion regulation. And then we can have a questionnaire when the kid is three or the kid is even much older if we follow up, right? And see what predicted the child having better emotion regulation skills according to these traditional methods. And there might be a special recipe of what parents do, right? That predicts better emotion regulation later. And it might come down to these, um, to kind of the trajectory of becoming more organized in valence, which itself is dependent on uh, just what the parent does in the moment. And it's, it's kind of cool to think we might be able to extract that from this very noisy you know, video data set in the end. I'd like to tie into that question. There were a couple places in your talk that got me thinking about culture. What you just said now also relates to another presentation we had about how parents follow their child's initiate communication initiation attempts and then measuring that with FNIRS. When I got to the US, I noticed how much this community and cultures, culture is infant-centered. It's like here, we notice that, I see that parents have so much patience. They really encourage their kids to do stuff. They monitor them. They really try to elicit things from their children. They try to elicit more expression and creativity. But not every culture has that approach. Other cultures take a more, you know, like direct from parent to child that, you know, parents view themselves as educating their child much more than trying to draw things out from the children. So I'm thinking about how that would impact parent-infant communication. And if perhaps it's more parent-directed, how would that influence the type of synchrony that we see in FNIR's measurements with those coupling studies? And what you just said about emotional regulation, if different cultural contexts maybe then lead to more rigid understandings of emotion, but still what we see is regardless of whether you are an American adult, a Chinese adult, a European adult, we all learn how to self-regulate. We all learn how to talk. So how do you think about that? Like, I'm sure you've already considered lots of things, but I think that culture is just a really important part of the variation. And well, I'll wrap it up there. I don't know how to structure yeah, my question. Sure. Just, yeah. Thank you, Elaya. So, well, I'll start with what I want to repeat and say, New Jersey babies, you know, this is not the world. <laughs> this is babies in central New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. Um, so we are, we are, of course, not going to generalize to humankind. Um, one interesting, uh, one interesting answer I have here is that our corpus from Nairobi, Kenya, so far, is showing that it seems to be pretty comparable. At least, so I'm not saying that is representative of anything beyond urban Nairobi, Kenya, right? But it's at least showing some parallels in the kind of variation you see across these communicative um, signals in that sample so far. Again, we're only a little bit through coding, so I don't want to run too far with that idea. But it at least shows that you know something that we're investigating might not be just limited to the populations we think. Um, but one way I think to answer your question about cross-cultural variation is that um, 
peers, siblings, might be a much more salient uh, source of not only communication, but emotion regulation um, for some children in some cultures. So in fact, there are cultures, as you know, many of you know, where parents are not actually supposed to speak or interact with their infants or children much. Um, it can be considered actually, according to certain practices, bad luck. There's the evil eye phenomenon um, in some cultures in the world. And um, this doesn't mean there's no interaction. For example, there's still feeding, right, of course. But um, there's not as much direct communication um, with infants, at least according to traditional indices in here. And in these cases, right, siblings, neighbors, other kids are the ones interacting with kids much more. And they might be responsible for the growth of language a bit uh, with, with kind of a greater weight than caregivers, and then probably responsible for emotion regulation a bit more. Like they're the ones who indoctrinate the kid into local customs and norms. And I don't know if we can capture you know, that in our research at the moment, even our new corpus, um, but we still might be able to understand sibling influences and kid influences on development by you know, separating out their speech from parent speech, um, by looking at the way they perform actions versus parents and see if there's unique explanatory power to children's actions. So um, right now, you know, while I would love this crazy expensive project to be adopted other places in the world, it probably won't <laughs> for a long time. Um, but then I think we'd be able to learn something about how important this cultural variation uh, might be. And I'd be thrilled to be able to show someday that the questions we ask in the West, right, in weird samples are a complete mismatch to the, you know, questions and outcomes that matter in other cultures, because that's, um, it's something that matters to me greatly as a scientist. It's not about including, you know, non-Western, non-weird populations in our work. That's not the goal at all. The goal is to, to, to do community-engaged scholarship, right? And even from the beginning of research, ask what is interesting or important to, you know, you as parents and generate our research questions from there because it might look very different. Um, and I've had some exposure to this over time where I have seen research questions that I would never myself think to ask for my developmental background. Um, for example, variation in childcare across cultures, um, variation in exposure to different, I'll just say human behaviors such as violence on development, right? Um, it's gonna be so important to go ask questions about emotion regulation um, and social contingency and social network um, in you know, beyond the convenient samples that we're all used to. So unfortunately, um, our time is up. We do need to bring the session to a close and to thank you. Here is a token of our appreciation. It's not a lot, but it is something to remember us by and remember your visit. Um, we really so enjoyed your talk. Umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> it has a Gallaudet logo on it so you you know can show people whenever it's raining that you came here okay thank you everyone for being with us today thank you for joining us and we had over 40 people on zoom so i think that we got a good number of people to attend so thank you so much and i guess we'll see all of you at the next presentation thank you let's give our presenter a round of applause Thank you, Zoomers. Thank you. <laughs> oh, good. Wonderful. <laughs>